Well, good morning, everyone. Those of you in the parking lot and online, we want to thank you for uh, your coming this morning, your presence, and for those that could be here today. Uh, we're opening God's Word this morning to Psalm 119. And uh, one of the three goals that uh, Pastor has set before us, and we're going to honor that this morning, and that is a return to God's Word. I was listening this week to a radio program, and it was good, uh, but the thought just struck me. There's so much counsel in the Christian world today, but not enough focus on the Word of God. There's great principles for counseling, but walk with God is number one, isn't it? It's number one. And then the counseling can come. And God's, God is a great counselor. He is the almighty counselor. And we thank him for that. So we'd like to pray this morning and uh, then open God's word and <clears throat> see what God has for us today. Father, we thank you for the day today. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the word of God that we can freely open. And even if we in ourselves cannot understand it. The Holy Spirit enlightens our eyes at the right time to show us uh, our needs, to show us encouragement, to show us our need of conviction uh, or leading, whatever it might be. And we want to give you the praise and the honor and the glory as we open your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 119, we're going to cover again. It's uh, verses 129 through 136, this octave that we've been in for the last three or four weeks uh, based on Spurgeon's, Charles Spurgeon's, The Treasury of David. And as you turn there, please, Psalm 119, verse 129, just remind us of our goal. Our goal is to fall deeper and deeper in love with the Word of God that helps us to fall deeper in love with God. And then, as we discover God, His character, His love for us, we'll put feet to that and we'll walk more obediently. We will praise him more. We'll be more committed to service. Psalm 119, verse 129. David writes, Thy testimonies are wonderful. Therefore doth my soul keep them. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for thy commandments. Look thou upon me, and be merciful unto me, as a you usest to do to those that love thy name. Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. By the way, if you're struggling with sin, there's a wonderful verse to memorize. Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Verse 134, deliver me from the oppression of man, so will I keep thy precepts. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant and teach me thy statutes. Rivers of waters run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law. I was listening to a, uh, a song this week. It's entitled Ancient Words. If you've heard it, uh, it's just precious. It was written by Lynn DeShazo, and uh, it goes like this, and it's speaking of the Word of God. Holy words, long preserved for our walk in this world, they resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope, give us strength, help us cope in this world where'er we roam, ancient words will guide us home. The second verse says, holy words of our faith handed down to this age, come to us through sacrifice, O heed the faithful words of Christ. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world, they resound with God's own heart, O let the ancient words impart. And the chorus goes, holy words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. I love the goal or the focus of that song because it's on the word of God and it's ancient as far as we are concerned as people. But it's applicable today as it was for David, as it was for the patriarchs, isn't it? 
and it's going to be applicable for your great-grandchildren and for whomever comes later. It doesn't change. Who changes? Hmm. We change, don't we? We get our focus off of the Word of God onto something that is more modern. Um, so as a believer, we need to be in the Word of God to find out what God has for you and for me. Have we, as we've shared the last uh, three weeks, Spurgeon notes that the Word of God is full of wonderful revelations, wonderful commands. Sometimes we don't like those, do we? Because it doesn't go our way. Uh, wonderful judgments, sometimes we don't like those. We were talking a couple days ago about God's direction and, and taking that step of faith, and sometimes we don't want to do that for fear of fear, right? Fear of the unknown. And if we're honest with, if I'm honest with myself, God, I'm not quite so sure you can handle this. Hmm. And you know what happens as we take that step of faith? God blesses. God answers. God provides. And it's that next memorial stone that gets put on that pile that helps you and me in our walk with God. Uh, wonderful promises. Uh, sometimes we like to claim the promises, but we don't like to claim the commandments. You know, we want God to bless us, but nah, we're not so key on walking with God. Uh, we have wonderful truths. I'm so glad they don't change. And wonderful testimonies where God testifies of himself. This is who I am. And last week we finished uh, with a statement from Spurgeon, speaking of David, the more he wondered, the more he obeyed. The more you wonder at God's word, the more you're going to want to obey because you find out how wonderful God is and how wonderful his word is. Uh, as a brief illustration, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. I just want to put some feet to this and make it applicable, make it real. And we're speaking of David here, so let's talk about David. We have an Old Testament account here, uh, perhaps one that we're quick to share with children, David and Goliath. I strive not to use the word story of David and Goliath. I tell my kids stories. I read my, or my grandkids now, I don't, I read my grandchildren's stories. Uh, I tell them stories, I make up stories, but you know what, David and Goliath is not a story. This happened, this is real life. So we have an account here of David and Goliath and his brief battle, and you know, we know it so well, right? But I was revisiting it this week as I was preparing for the lesson. And uh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Now, we're not going to read the account, most of it this morning. But we talk about these six different wonderful things about God's word. Let's, talk, let's think about Revelation. God revealed himself to David, did he not? He also revealed himself to the soldiers that were around David, didn't he? Hmm. That's not a good thing. And he also revealed himself to the Philistines. They found out that day who God was. The one that Goliath had mocked and the Philistines had mocked. God revealed himself. And we see God's commands that were not heeded that day. Everybody's hiding in their tents. Even the bra bravest soldier is fearful of this giant. Now, humanly speaking, I would be fearful too with this nine-foot guy standing in front of me. He was a tree trunk, but not in God's eyes. We see God's judgment when the Philistines were clearly routed that day. God said, this is it. That's enough. You have gone too far. God's promises to David were revealed. God said to David, I want you to go to battle with this man. No, you're not going to go to battle in your flesh, in your humanity, in your weak strength, because David's only a teenager going up against 
a nine-foot, well-seasoned warrior. And yet God's truths were so evident. I want to look at Psalm, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel 17, verse 29. This really caught my eye as I read this. When Goliath defied the Israelites and God. Now, it's one thing to defy the people of God, but when you get up there and you spew your defiance of God, and David heard all this, in verse, one, in verse 29, David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? So why are we here today battling the Philistines? What's the cause? To sit around and have a picnic and just throw insults back and forth? How foolish is that? You know, uh, a veteran would laugh at that because he's been in the trenches. He's been there fighting the real enemy. So David is basically saying here, why are you here today? Is there not a cause? And I think that's so applicable for you and for me. Isn't there a cause today? Number one, it's a cause to walk with God. And then it's a cause to touch your neighbor, your coworker, your friend, your relative for Jesus Christ. Well, I've witnessed to them and they don't come to Christ. Whose responsibility is that? That's God's. I'm accountable to, to plant the word or to put some water on that word, okay? Just like we talked about gardens this morning. You may not plant the seed, but you know what? Somebody might share that produce with you someday. And uh, so God's truths were so, so evident that day. And then lastly, God testified of himself that day that his name would not be mocked. Look at verse 46 and 47 of 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17, 46 and 47, where God testifies of himself that his name would not be mocked. This day will the Lord deliver you, this is David speaking to Goliath, into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from me, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands." It's interesting that David shared publicly, Philistines, you are going to know this day. Goliath, you're going to know this day that there is a God in Israel. And all you Israelite soldiers out there, it's time for you to know that there is a God in Israel. And God is going to reveal himself today through this brief battle on the, on the battlefield there. It's not a story in a child's storybook. This is a literal truth of what took place that day, where a teenager took his knowledge of the Word of God and he put feet to the truth. Now, you might say verse 46 and verse 47 are, are pretty bold statements. Mm-hmm. <laughs> A number of the Israelite soldiers thought he was pretty rude. He was pretty arrogant. He was pretty proud. But David knew in his heart that God had given Goliath into his hand that day. And so he was not afraid. And consider this for a moment, that how this event must have molded David's character as he faced further struggles in life. You take a battle like this as a teenager and see a great victory and how that plants feet 
in the strong foundation of the Word of God for those days when the struggles come. How many truths did you learn as a young child and you kind of took them for granted and yet then you were faced with a real struggle in life and God says, see, here's, your, here's my word, stick to it and I will provide for you. If God can help me defend this giant, he's going to help me next time. How many giants do you face today? Health difficulties? There's a spiritual struggle in your family? There's a loved one who's ill? There's a situation at work that you have no control over? And yet your God does. God's in control of everything. We can't just say these things, Christian. How many times during COVID did I hear someone say, I'm so fearful? And I would say to them, but God's in control. Well, yeah, I know that, but... See, that's a superficiality in the Christian walk. Yeah, I know you're right, Pastor Tim, but you know what? No. We need to take the word of God, we need to hang on to it tight, and we need to trust God through it, and to be honest, sometimes we don't see the end of it on this earth. But when that tribulation starts, are you going to hang on to God? Hang on to his word. There is nothing in this world, nothing that's going to be an eternal foundation. Your finances could be wiped out tomorrow. Your health could be destroyed tomorrow. We don't know what holds tomorrow except God. And these giants that we face today, let's face them as David did. He was anchored in the word of God. So we talk about these wonderful aspects of the word of God this is true. I have to ask us this morning, what do you use as a filter when the trial comes? Well, let me see if I have enough money for that. Oh, no, I don't. What am I going to do? Have you ever done that? I have. Yeah. By the way, this is not my money. <laughs> this is God's money. He gave it to me for a purpose. And it's not to spend. We saw a billboard the other day at a bank, you know, and they want you to spend your money. And that doesn't make any sense because banks want your money. Now they want you to spend it and go into debt, I assume. Who does your money belong to? Larry Burkett one time made a very bold statement. He said, show me your wallet and I'll show you your walk with God. And the first time I heard that, it was like, no, that, yeah, you know. There are over 2,000 references to finances in the Word of God. Must be a little important, huh? But that's just one giant we face. For some, it's the financial pressures on a day-to-day -day basis. But I have to ask this, what does the Word of God say? Well, I don't know. Well, there are enough electronic tools out there today that you can find out what this verse means. But before that, ask the Holy Spirit for illumination, where the light bulb gets turned on. I love that aspect of teaching, when it's like, oh, now I get it. Doesn't happen very often. <laughs> but for the Christian, it ought to happen every week as we're in the Word of God. You know, we read and study books that draw our attention due to our interest, right? So if you're a Civil War buff, you're going to visit the battlefield, you're going to go to Gettysburg, you're going to read books, you're going to watch documentaries, you're going to visit the museums. If you're a doctor, it's an ongoing, not just study, but practice 
what you have learned. An engineer is going to study building structures, always honing his skills on new techniques. And you know what? He's also going to study failed structures. So one of the first things that happens when a bridge collapses, they want to know why it happened so they can prevent it for the next time. It's kind of interesting that that architect is going to make sure that that building stands because his name is on it. Not on the stone in front of the entrance, but if there's any problems down the road, guess who they call? They call the architect. Unfortunately, often for me, there is a disconnect. There is a strong connection between the architect and the engineering of that building. There's a strong connection between the doctor's practice and me <laughs> when he operates on me. But we have somehow disconnect the word of God with our own lives in so many, many circumstances. It's full of wonders, and yet it often sits on the nightstand or the bookshelf. You know, if we apply the accounts of last year when COVID-19 appeared in the scene, so many Christians faced it with fear. Why? I would say principally because we don't know enough about the author of the Word of God, and we don't know enough about the content of the Word of God. Now let's take an engineer, for example. Suppose you're the engineer, you're young, you've studied, you've practiced, you've been part of a firm, and then the boss comes to you one day and he says, you get the big project. You've been waiting for this, right? I want to be in charge. We like that. I want to be in charge. So what does he do? Oh, no, I don't know what to do. No. He doesn't panic. He doesn't wring his hands. He doesn't run around the office and say, what am I going to do? Is anybody going to help me here? No. No, 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 no. Guess what he does? He goes to the engineering manuals. He knows the math. He knows how that building is to be designed. He doesn't do the construction of it. That's somebody else's job. And then that contractor trusts the engineering or the engineer. He follows code. We would be quite disconcerted if we asked him to come in here and told him that we wanted him to design a new church. And he said to you, I don't know, this project might fail. <laughs> Kick him out of here. Get somebody else. Hey, Christian, do we often look at the word of God and say, oh, God, I don't know about you. God never says to me, Tim, uh, this is going to fail you. No, it always, always holds true. You know, let's suppose you're going in for major heart surgery. And just before the anesthesia takes over, your doctor says, well, I'm not sure how this is going to go. I'm worried that I might work on the wrong valve. I sure hope you wake up. <laughs> and out you go. Well, <laughs> you're beyond uh, any control there. I, I think I would wake up quite quickly. <laughs> the anesthesia would kind of, <laughs> my adrenaline would take over. So why is there a disconnect with Christians in the struggles that we are facing, or we think we will face? Uh, they say that 90% of our fears never come to fruition. So why don't you just worry about the 10%? No, better yet, let's give the 10% to God and just dismiss the 90%. It's either a lack of knowledge of the Word of God, or it's direct disobedience to God for what he tells us in our word, in his word. You know, if it's a lack of knowledge, let's seek out the scriptures. What does the Bible say about marriage, about finances, about work ethic, about truthfulness, about abortion, about homosexuality, premarital sex, attending church, identifying biblical error? We have the knowledge in the manual here. Don't go to the search engine. Go to the source. Go to God's word. Doesn't matter if you're a teenager or a young child. 
a new Christian, a mature Christian, makes no difference. The Word of God is applicable for you and for me. By the way, the engineer or the heart surgeon is not going to call me for advice. It doesn't work that way. Let's go to the Word of God and let's seek God's advice for things. So the question must be asked here, what's my passion? What am I passionate about? Is the Word of God so wonderful that it is your number one passion? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. What are you passionate about? Hopefully you have a hobby, you have an interest, you have an occupation, you have an act activity, but may it never take precedence over the Word of God. No matter how much you enjoy it, or sometimes it's work, no matter how much you have to be engaged in work, and sometimes your boss asks you to work overtime, makes no difference. The Word of God must take precedence. Let's go to Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. Psalm 139. Verses 23 and 24. We have here a prayer that often we are fearful of praying because we're afraid of what God might reveal to us. And yet if we pray this with true intent, God's going to help line up my passion with the Word of God. And the other things of life are going to take second and third and fourth place. Psalm 139, 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. By the way, God already knows my heart. I don't need to ask God to search my heart. But if I do, I am showing Him His authority and His rule and His love and my need for help. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. When we are centering our lives on the Word of God, life is going to be wonderful, and sin is going to take a back seat, and Christ is going to be the focus of my life. I want to go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4.12. We've shared this verse often, but the following verses are so powerful, so wonderful. Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Before we go any further, if you have cancer and the doctor is operating on you, how far do you want him to go? You want every single cell removed that he can see, that he can detect. Is that true for the Christian? That I want God to get down into my heart and life and in his wonderful, wonderful ways as my eternal physician. His goal is to get me healthier. I'm never going to be fully healthy until I get to heaven. But spiritually, he wants me healthy. Verse 13, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now, let's not stop here. We have a God who wants to help me get healthier, but he wants to help me. He doesn't just do the work of the surgeon. He provides the healing qualities. Verse 14, seeing then, <coughs> excuse me, that we have a great high priest. Let's stop there. This is Jesus. 
Jesus is my high priest. Now in the Old Testament, I took my prayers to the high priest. I confessed my sin to the high priest. And then he went before God in the Holy of Holies to present the needs, the sins of the people and ask for forgiveness. But now, Jesus is my high priest. And when I pray, you know, we, we finish our prayer in Jesus' name. That's not just an expression. Because what happens is, as I pray for an individual, like we did this morning, my prayer goes to Jesus, and Jesus takes my prayer to his Father. And he says, Father, Tim has this strong need on his heart for so-and-so. And he becomes my advocate. He comes, becomes my go-between, and he takes my prayer to the Father. Isn't that awesome? That's how much God loves us. So let's move on here. Verse 14. Seeing then, or because we have such a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Let's hang tight to the foundation of the Word of God. Verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. It's not a physical man. But was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Jesus faced the temptations as a human. He was 100% human. He was 100% God. Verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is God's invitation to you and to me, to come boldly. Now, it doesn't say brashly, and it doesn't say arrogantly. And I would encourage us to go humbly. And yet, when we pray, let's pray scripture. God, this is what you've said. This is what you've said, God. And I'm coming to you boldly, and yet humbly, and asking you to fulfill that promise. Is there a disconnect in your life between what the Word of God says and putting feet to the gospel? Men and ladies, this is so wonderful, this invitation that you and I have to come boldly before the throne of grace. Prayer meeting on Wednesday night for the guys, Tuesday morning prayer meeting, for our own selves, individually. Prayer is that key to putting feet to the Word of God. And it kind of takes the humanity aside and my pride and my self-help and I can do this and I show, I tell God, God, I can't do this. I'm your servant and I'm going to give this difficulty this problem to you. So back to Spurgeon's comment about David. The more he wondered, the more he obeyed. Let's go to Psalm 40, verse 5. Psalm 40, verse 5. Psalm 40, verse 5. David here speaks of God's wonderful works. Psalm 45. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to. Is that next word? Us word? God loves me. God's thoughts are about me. Do you ever think about it? God thinking about you? That's a pretty profound, wonderful, encouraging thought. There's not a disconnect between God and his children. God's thinking about you. And David says here that these thoughts are wonderful. 
His works are wonderful. God has me in view as he does his work. So the next time you grumble about one of God's requirements, remember that these commands of God are for my good, my spiritual health, and my physical health, and my mental health. If you want an interesting read sometimes, I believe that sometime, I think it was John Wesley who wrote about sin and a physician's examination about the sins of the people. And he talked about most sins could be avoided, especially dealing with health. He was talking about mental health and physical health. Most of those could be avoided simply by following the Word of God. Now, that doesn't mean because you have a physical condition, it's because of sin. No. Because some things that happen to us, we have no control over. Well, nothing we have control over. But, you know, if you drink and drive, you've pretty much set yourself up for some pretty serious consequences. Going back to Psalm 45. Many, O Lord, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. It's pretty wonderful. <clears throat> if you start thinking about considering, meditating, contemplating God, <clears throat> I hope you couldn't stop talking about it. That's what David is saying here. They cannot be numbered. Wonder is created and developed through experience. But that experience cannot take place without knowledge. So back to a hobby, um, an occupation you're involved in. You know, you can sit there all day in the, in the classroom and study it but until you start practicing it, it's of little value. We have a grandson that has just fallen in love with the octopus. He's five years old. Not the octopus, by the way. And his, his knowledge of the octopus is pretty amazing. It's far beyond what I have uh, any knowledge of. He's got books about the octopus. He's visited the octopus at the aquarium. You know, he watches shows about the octopus. And one day, one of his grandmothers made the mistake of telling him that the octopus and the squid were the same thing. Well, she got her ears filled with knowledge about the octopus because they are not the same thing. But you know, without that trip to the aquarium, it's pretty much head knowledge until you actually see it in action. And in comparison, a man can read God, God's word, but if I don't put it into action, then we get those expressions like, well, I don't read the word of God anymore because I can't understand it, or it's boring, or it's not applicable to life today. Well, it's all three of those things if it's just head knowledge. Until you put God's word to the test and you put feet to it, it is of little value. It becomes mundane. But if I read it out of obedience, if I read it out of duty, as we talked about last week, God's going to start to work in my heart. And he's going to encourage me to follow. <clears throat> Did you pray this morning and say, God, show me something special? in your word that applies to my heart and my life for today. Tomorrow will take care of itself, says Matthew, just for today. If we go back to Psalm 119.
If we jump down to verse 131, Psalm 119, 131, David said, I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for thy commandments. Do you long to get into the word of God? David knew the secret of walking with his creator God. Read it, study it, hide it in your heart, meditate upon it. Be a miser. Be a miner. Be a miser. Hold it for yourself and then share it with other people. Practice what you've learned. You may wonder how that gem of truth truly works. And then you're going to be wondering in a wonderful way. It's going to help to drive you back to the Word of God. Have we lost the wonder of sitting down with the Word of God and opening it as a treasure? Remember that book that you can't wait to get back to to find a whodunit? You think you figured it out, and at the end you found out that you didn't know what you were talking about. But, you know, I've, I don't do this anymore, but I would stay up till 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning to finish that book because I can't wait to get to the end of it. Now, some of you ladies, what do you do? You just go to the end and you read the ending. That's not even fair. You miss the whole, and then you go back and start reading again, but you already know the end of it. That doesn't make any sense to me. That's probably better than staying up till 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, but do we hold the Word of God as a treasure in our hands? It is simply wonderful. May we pray to God, thank you, Lord, for allowing me just a peek into this treasure mine. I'm so privileged. I'm so blessed by your act of grace. So may I never stop being a miner who exalts when the next gem is unearthed. Now, that's for me personally. I might come to you and say, do you know what I found out in the Word of God this morning? And you might be saying to yourself, yeah, I learned that one 10 years ago. It's new for me. And that's what the Holy Spirit does as we open the Word of God. May God be the one who gets honored and glorified as he lifts his word high, and I personally honor it. So we finish with half of verse 129. So we're going to be here for a while. But that's the mining of God's word. That's how wonderful it is, deeper and deeper and deeper into that mine. Let's pray this morning. Father God, we thank you so much for the word of God. And let's not be thankful that it sits on a shelf, but let's open it. Let's find out for ourselves what the Word of God has for us. It's interesting that each of us lives a different life. Our lives are unique. We're created by you. We have different interests. We have different abilities. We have different likes and dislikes. And Lord, your Word is going to address us, first of all, individually. And then, as we sit together like this morning, it can be addressed jointly. But thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us. And may, it be, may the word of God be honored and glorified and exalted in each of our lives. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you.